Joe Colombo was a man who liked to do things differently. He was the only mobster who dared to protest against the FBI. You don't go to war with the United States government. No, nobody goes to war with the United States government. They're too powerful. But Colombo did. His weapon of choice, mass protest. There's a conspiracy in this country against every Italian American. We've been saying this, we'll continue to say it, and it's only till it touches them. But in following this path, Colombo moved from crime into politics and the glare of publicity. On the way, he broke the cardinal rule of the Mafia. He was the one that chose publicity over silence. He was the one that chose cameras over staying in the shadows. Colombo became infatuated with fame and celebrity and completely forgot the way a mobster should live. This uh, incensed the old mafiosa. They didn't want that. And he was told, stop this. If you continue, you're going to pay a price. In the heart of Manhattan, in front of thousands of witnesses, Joe Colombo would face his day of reckoning. Across the East River from Manhattan lies the borough of Brooklyn. In 1962, this was Mafia country. The hunting ground of Joseph Colombo. The 40-year-old mobster lived and worked these streets. He was a capo, or captain, a mid-ranking mafioso in New York's Profacci crime family. One of the five crime families that dominated the city's criminal underworld. Then, in 1964, an event took place that would supercharge his career. Colombo was summoned by his mafia boss, to an important meeting. Joe Magliocco had a mission for him. It was a hit, and a particularly dangerous one. For Joseph Colombo, this was nothing new. He had already killed people, about 11 murders to date. Rubbing people out was what Capos did. You would never advance to Capo without killing. They tell you to kill somebody, you go out and kill somebody. And you don't resign except be first. You would not even be considered for Capo unless you've murdered somebody. On orders from the boss. So until this moment, Colombo was nothing special within Mafia circles. Just one killer amongst many. There were plenty of people like that around. Typical kind of uh, hoodlum, nothing outstanding about him that, that I know of. But that was about to change forever. The target this time was none other than Carlo Gambino. From a young hoodlum, he had become New York's biggest mafia godfather. Gambino was generally regarded as the most powerful boss in the city. He was unquestionably the most fearsome mobster in town. Gambino had built his family into New York's toughest clan. He could take on three out of the five families at one time. That's how big his organization was. And he had some of the best killers that there were. If you kill Carlo Gambino, that was the kiss of death. So, rather than kill Carlo Gambino, Colombo decided to tip him off. He was now breaking one of the mob's most important rules.
Every Mafia family relies on unswerving loyalty from its members. This is one of the so-called Ten Commandments. Your family comes first. Always. You swear allegiance to that family and only that family. Nothing, nothing will come before your family, your Mafia. And everything else takes second place to it. But Colombo completely rejected this. He went straight to the man he'd been told to kill. Carlo Gambino. The move worked well. Gambino was grateful. First, he ordered Colombo's boss, Joe Magliocco, to retire. Then, as a reward for Colombo's bold move, he was given Magliocco's old job. He was promoted to head of a family, renamed in his honor. The Profacci family became the Colombo family in 1964. Sometimes if you want to advance, you have to make bold moves. Very bold. Very bold, but it worked out. Colombo had made Mafia history. He became the youngest godfather in a generation. Thanks to Colombo's new position, there were now real benefits. He could live off the proceeds of crime paid to him by his criminal family members. Well, if you're the godfather, you're the boss of the family, and depending upon the size of that family, uh, all your capos have to be bringing an envelope up to you. Everything that is brought into the family is kicked up to the head of the family. Colombo eagerly took over the best money-making operations, and the cash rolled in. Anywhere where there was money to be made, you could find organized crime. They know how to make money out of just about anything. There was illegal gambling. Sometimes games were rigged to earn extra cash. Well, the gambling ra racket was basically you could have a, a floating crap game or a, a, a poker game, and it could be moved anywhere within the, the city of New York. I mean, it had cocktail waitress and everything. It was a high-end roller, and it still goes on today. <laughs> Colombo and his men didn't just make money from the bets, but also from loan sharking to gamblers or anyone who needed cash fast. Loan sharking, or Shylock loans, charged borrowers huge rates of weekly interest, known as the VIG. Basically, there are many people out there that need money, and banks would not but not that readily give them the money because they had no financial backing. Organized crime would, of course, he would pay an interest on the money, almost 25 to 26 percent. If you miss a payment, they'll double the VIG. If you carried on missing payments, you could expect a beating, or worse. The loan shark book of any Mafia operator could run into hundreds of thousands of dollars of weekly income. It was an easy way to make cash on the street. Colombo also made money from hijacking trucks and cargoes. The stolen goods were then sold on, known as fencing. Added to the mix, was extortion, protection rackets, and infamous Mafia-run union scams. Unions controlled everything from construction to garbage. So the Mafia took over the unions. They plundered the pension funds and set up trade monopolies that benefited only them. As a result, Colombo was getting seriously rich. The only problem was this wealth began to attract the attention of the police and the FBI. A 
couple of years into Colombo's reign, the authorities started to look hard at organized crime in New York. In the previous decade, the police and FBI had been slow to recognize the threat posed by the Mafia. Now Colombo and the city's Mafia families were in their sights. In September 1966, the FBI and Queen's District Attorney's Office made its first breakthrough. A massive bust at the La Stella restaurant in the east of the city. La Stella was a restaurant on Queens Boulevard in Queens, and they brought in the mob chiefs from all over the country, and they uh, all sat down and broke bread and went over their operations, and uh, we were able to get information from an informant that they were all there and we raided the place. The Queen's district attorney made a big deal of the raid. These are 13 of the top uh, mob leaders in the country. Their meeting has nationwide implications in our uh, opinion and uh, as far as we know this is a unique meeting. We uh, have never had such a meeting of top family leaders and gangdom leaders in this county to our knowledge. It heralded the start of a new fight back against the mob, and especially the New York families. Colombo, as a family head, was now on the law enforcement radar. In 1966, he was subpoenaed to stand as a witness in a federal investigation into racketeering. It meant appearing before what's known under the American system as a grand jury. Well, everybody's afraid of uh, what's going to happen in a federal grand jury because it forces people to come in to appear and give testimony. And now you lock them into that testimony. Colombo could no longer hide in the shadows. He was dragged into a very public arena. But when he came to court, he stuck to mob protocols and refused to testify, insisting he was just an honest businessman. One of the codes of the mob is don't make yourself a target. Don't make yourself to go out there and bring attention to you and to our operation, what they call our thing, cause an ostra. The code of silence is, is held by a lot of different groups. And the old bosses believed in keeping a low profile and your mouth shut. His strict observance of this tradition cost him. His punishment was 30 days in jail. An easy stretch. But for Joe Colombo, this was an epiphany. He realized what attracted the FBI and police to him was his wealth without any visible source of income. So he devised a perfect solution to deal with a new heat from the FBI. He would become an ordinary working Joe. And he passed down a diktat that all his family members had to hold down a real job too. A facade of legality. Colombo led by example. He worked as a salesman at Cantalupo Realty, based here at 86th Street in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. On their books, the Godfather was a $35,000 a year employee. In reality, he conducted his mafia business at the offices. Now, when pressed by the authorities, he could explain his lifestyle and what a lifestyle it was. The money flooded in from his numerous rackets. And Colombo was starting to get carried away with his status. He headed across town to party and enjoy the good life in Manhattan. 
He became increasingly flamboyant and extravagant. Bedecked in expensive jewelry and suits, Columbo cruised around the city in flashy Cadillacs. Joey liked to dress like the biggest actors. He liked to dress as good as Frank Sinatra. He liked to dress as good as Dean Martin. He didn't want to look like the poor schlep. He just didn't buy a suit off the rack. The suits were tailored made, silk shirts. He had everything made, everything was tailored. Uh, he was meticulous about his clothes. By now, other mobsters had learned this was not a good idea. Flashing the cash drew the attention of the authorities. Carlo Gambino, you'd never see him in a nightclub or a bar or checking out with women. He was just low key. And the other mafia clans were right to worry. Colombo had reignited attention from the FBI and the income tax authorities, who started to look even more closely at his finances. $35,000 a year and tailor-made suits and shirts did not add up. So the FBI decided to go after Colombo. In 1970, his son, Joe Jr., was arrested for melting down silver coins to extract precious metals. Colombo viewed this as a trumped-up charge designed to get at him. It was the final straw. Now, he hit upon a radical solution to the FBI sniffing around his affairs. Civil rights. After all, this was a rich time for civil rights activism. Across America, street protest was flourishing. The African-American civil rights movement was changing the face of America and inspired many other minority groups into action. We're going to walk together. We're going to stand together, we're going to sing together, we're going to stay together, we're going to moan together, we're going to groan together, and after a while, we'll say, freedom, freedom, freedom now! So Colombo got on the bandwagon. From a campaign office here at 7th Avenue, the former hitman prepared to step fully out of the shadows and into the glare of publicity and politics. We feel that the people have had it, and the Italian people in particular, in the United States, which number 38 million, have been losing its identity as time has been going on, more and more and more so. He exploited the growing unrest in the Italian-American community of the time. He claimed that Italians were being discriminated against. There was some truth in that. At that particular time, you found very few Italian names on Wall Street in law or banking firms. And a lot of Italian Americans were not involved in any kind of organized crime or any other kind of crime. So, Colombo would stand up for the rights of ordinary Italian Americans. And he started in a way that nobody could have foreseen. He, in effect, he declared war on the FBI. So he began picketing FBI headquarters, which was then on the Upper East Side. It was a remarkable opening salvo, picketing the very heart of law enforcement in New York. He thought, if I, I claim that they're discriminating against me, I can either make them back off or slow them down. Day after day, a crowd of demonstrators harassed FBI agents coming and going and accused them of unduly targeting men like himself who were legitimate businessmen. Why the FBI? Why is the FBI, in your mind, persecuting the Italians? He used all his underlings, and we used to call them MOOCs, M-O-O-K-S, to stand out there and do the picketing for him. 
Well, it's, uh, it's obvious by just what everybody could read in the paper. Uh, every time you see something, you see that uh, the FBI is labeling Italian people belonging to an organization which they refer to as the Mafia. As far as we're concerned, as Italian people, there is no such thing. It's a word that's been invented by the law enforcement agencies, and we don't feel it's right. The crowds grew, and media attention followed. Colombo reveled in it. There's a conspiracy in this country against every Italian American. We've been saying this, we'll continue to say it, and it's only till it touches them. And who are they? Are they any better than you or I or anybody else standing in this crowd? This unspoken challenging of authority was unheard of in Mafia circles. It was in marked contrast to his silence at the grand jury years before. Mafia men, used to speaking in hushed tones of the Cosa Nostra, were unsettled. Why declare war on law enforcement? You're going to have enough trouble with them as it is. Why make it personal? The worry growing in the highest circles of the Mafia was law enforcement scrutiny would intensify because of Colombo's actions. But initially, for the FBI agents, it was a new, unsettling tactic. The tables had been turned. I know a lot of them were very furious with him. There were some collisions there on the picket lines where they almost came to blows. Now I'll go a little further. Many of the other minority groups are starting to feel this thing. And when they get through with us, they have to go on to the next body of people. And this is where the public should wake up, and this is where the public should start demanding some of these things be brought out to light. And why are they so frightened of an investigation? And why shouldn't there be an investigation on them? In 1970, Colombo shifted his protest movement up a gear. He created the Italian American Civil Rights League. Everybody wanted to be attached to it. Everybody, including the politicians, uh, radio commentators, actors, singers, everybody. And then people started to realize, hey, the Italians contributed a lot, and a lot they should be a proud of. The League, with Colombo at the helm, had huge success almost instantly recruiting some 50,000 paid-up members to its cause. Now you see uh, nationality flags. Well, Joe Colombo started it. It was the Italian flag being placed on every Cadillac that was, it was in Brooklyn, owned by an Italian, or a Lincoln owned by an Italian. Every car had an Italian flag on it. Everybody bought into it. And Colombo's league achieved some notable early victories. They took their campaign to the highest echelons of corporate America. Major brands like General Motors and Alka-Seltzer were targeted. Their ad campaigns were considered demeaning to Italian Americans. The League got them withdrawn. They also got a board game based on the Mafia pulled from Macy's department store. Even Hollywood felt the wrath of the League. Producers of the Godfather movie started to have trouble filming in New York. Production was threatened by walkouts, obstructions and delays. The League came to the rescue, offering to smooth the process if the producers agreed to remove all references to the Mafia or Cosa Nostra from the script. League captains then toured Italian-American neighborhoods to sell the idea of the film to skeptical residents. Finally, filming was allowed to continue uninterrupted on the landmark Godfather film. Colombo went further still. He even got the New York mayor, prosecutors and FBI to stop referring to the term mafia in its official documentation as it was prejudicial. The city was listening to Joe Colombo and the league was proving to be highly effective. 
In 1970, Colombo was ready for the league's showpiece. Its first Italian-American Unity Day rally to be held in Columbus Circle in the heart of Manhattan. Under the glare of news cameras, 50,000 people attended. The city's traditionally bustling Little Italy's were deserted. The other mob families reluctantly allowed Italian-American businesses to close for the day in solidarity. There was so much press and the streets were just mobbed with, with people that were so proud of being Italian and everybody wanted to get up on the, the, the day is to be standing next to Joe Colombo when he spoke of national pride and fellowship. My fellow Americans, I... Colombo held the stage and attacked the law enforcement community. It was a triumph for the godfather turned activist. In the wake of the rally, Interview followed interview. He appeared on TV chat shows and in magazine articles. Yeah, I mean, he gave uh, press conferences to all the major newspapers, the Daily News, the New York Mirror, uh, the Post. I mean, every newspaper wanted to hear from him. Publicly, he continued to describe the Mafia as a myth and promised to champion the rights of all minorities. Is the Italian American Civil Rights League accomplishing the aims that were set forth? Oh, definitely. What has it done? How has it done? It has helped, not me personally, but helped all people. It has helped people of all ethnic groups. It's helped children. It's helped elderly people. It's helped anyone that needs help. It's made people feel that there are no orphans, and anybody who would want help would only have to ask for it, and they would have it. Up until now, Colombo's league had preserved an air of legality. However, under Colombo, this positive gloss was wearing thin. Because he was still a mobster, and the league was just another money-making opportunity. American Civil Rights League was created by Joe Colombo to fight against discrimination. As far as that went, it wasn't a bad idea, but he was the wrong person to be doing something like that. He was the wrong person to be represented as a leader of the Italian-American community. In fact, Colombo was hijacking a legitimate cause. The League proved to be a money spinner. It was netting him plenty of funds that he could appropriate. Joe Colombo formed the Italian-American Civil Rights as a racket, as a scam to make money, period. And he used it for that purpose. He was shaking down store owners all over Italian neighborhoods, forcing them to put his sticker in a window. It was an Italian flag with a one on it, Italian-American Civil Rights League, and he actually was garnering receipts from that. A very wise state senator here who was an Italian-American said, uh, Colombo, don't be fooled by Colombo. Colombo wasn't just breaking the law by skimming off a legitimate cause. He was creating jealousy and suspicion in the Mafia ranks and within his own family. His old mentor, Carlo Gambino, started to warn him. And he was told by Carlo, stop this. We don't want it. And no ands, ifs, or buts was taken. If you continue, you're going to pay a price. But Colombo was oblivious to any looming danger. He thought he was untouchable, on the crest of a wave, and a media darling. He wouldn't back down. 1971 was going to be his year. Colombo was an egotist. He figured he was bigger and better than the unit that he was working with, which was the Mafia. Then, there was more trouble. 
the FBI struck again. Angered by Colombo's actions through the Italian-American Civil Rights League, they issued subpoenas for various high-profile bosses. In December 1970, he was arrested, along with one of his men, Rocco Miraglia. When police searched their car, they found a briefcase stuffed full of incriminating documents detailing the various Colombo family rackets. But worse still, the names of other high-ranking mob men. Colombo was immediately called before a federal grand jury to explain himself. But then he did something utterly unforgivable. Rather than keeping his mouth shut, like he had the last time he came before a grand jury, he adopted a different tactic and decided to talk his way out of it. He explained that the dollar amounts next to names were simply donations for his league. Carl, he explained, was none other than Carlo Gambino, reputed mafia boss. The $30,000 next to his name was actually a donation to the League. That was a bad move. You don't implicate the boss of bosses before a grand jury, especially when you're telling a lie. The repercussions were immediate. That same year, the police department moved in on the Mafia and federal strike forces combed the city. Even Carlo Gambino paid the price. He was arrested in 1970. It was clear that it was Colombo's loose mouth that had got him into deep trouble. With his former protector and with the FBI. His behavior began to worry bosses like Carlo Gambino. This uh, incensed the old mafiosa. They didn't want that. They wanted silence. They wanted to stay in the shadows. And Joe was bringing them out. Joe Colombo's days were now numbered. But despite the looming threat, Colombo planned to fight on with his tried and tested formula. He would roll out the league across America. He even booked Frank Sinatra for a fundraiser at Madison Square Gardens. Politicians joined the cause, including state governor Nelson Rockefeller. And he planned another showcase rally as a platform for his ever-expanding league. This rally would seal his status as a civil rights activist and keep the forces of law and order off his back. But by now, his enemies inside the mob were stirring. An old adversary from his early days as family boss was waiting in the wings. Crazy Joe Gallo was watching events from prison with a critical eye. Joey Gallo was called Crazy Joe, and there was a reason for that, because he did crazy things. I'll give you an example of Joe Gallo's operation. They had a club on President Street in Brooklyn, and in the basement they had a mountain lion that they used to intimidate victims, meaning gambling victims who owed them money or loan sharking victims. And if somebody didn't pay up, they'd just bring him to the club on President Street, open the door to the basement, and down at the bottom of the stairs would be this mountain lion, ready to, you know, and they would do what they were told. Colombo and Joe Gallo had form. He and his brothers, Larry and Albert, known as the Gallo clan, had once tried to take over the Colombo family. In the 1960s, they led a bloody insurrection from their base here at President Street in Brooklyn, until Joe Colombo brokered a peace deal with Larry and Albert Gallo while Crazy Joe was in jail. Now, 
Crazy Joe was itching to get back at old rival Columbo. The bottom line is jealousy. Gallo wanted to be the boss of the family, Columbo was the boss of the family, and Gallo wanted to take him out. Simple as that. Gallo needed soldiers for the forthcoming showdown. And he had a novel idea where to find them. Behind bars, he had made contacts and alliances with African-American gangsters from East Harlem. This was something no one in the Mafia had ever attempted. The two groups were traditionally enemies. But Gallo was ahead of his time. He saw that if the two groups worked together, they could be stronger. Then, in February 1971, Colombo's old enemy, Crazy Joe Gallo, was released after nine years in prison. Publicly, he swore his Mafia days were over, and he renounced his criminal past. But privately, it was business as usual. He was back on the streets. In his eyes, the peace deal was null and void. As far as he was concerned, the war was never over, and he was preparing for a counterattack. So it was that the stage was set for the second Italian-American Unity Day rally, held in June 1971, at the same site as his triumph a year earlier, New York's Columbus Circle. They had a huge rally which attracted thousands and thousands of Italian Americans. This was Colombo's rally to rally the Italian people against the FBI and the New York City Police Department and law enforcement in general. Now we were a distance away taking pictures and doing intelligence work, taking plate numbers and observing who was there. However, something had changed. The Mafia bosses had instructed Italian-Americans to stay at work. The League was no longer tolerated. 40,000 fewer people turned out. Attendance was down then at the next Columbus Day rally. They passed the word that stores should not close and people should not attend. Just before noon, Colombo headed to the podium to speak. He was preparing to launch another stinging attack on the FBI. An African-American news cameraman with press credentials approached. As the journalists grabbed Colombo's attention for a soundbite, the newsman moved forward. I was there the day that happened, and lo and behold, up comes this gunman and shoots Colombo in the head. Down he goes. Then something even more remarkable happened. And the man that shot him was dead before he hit the floor. So there was actually two killings arranged that day. One to have Joe shot, and one to have the shooter killed. Joe Colombo was immediately rushed to hospital, alive, but comatose. Confusion reigned, and supporters were at a loss to explain what had happened. You know, he was down on the ground and there was blood on his right cheek. And, you know, uh, you know it's incredible. You, you, know, you, you don't expect to see these things in the course of a covering a story. And um, he, the shots kept coming, and, you know, and I was standing like, you know, three feet or less, and I, then I started to run. And I, I heard somebody else's shot, but I wasn't there. I ran. As far as I know, Joe is in Roosevelt Hospital in critical condition with two shot wounds, one in the chest and one in the head. And we understand the perpetrator is, one of the perpetrators is dead. You know who did it? I have no idea. I have no idea who did it. Did you see it? No, I did not see it. I was standing behind the stand when it happened. What's your reaction to this? 
Our reaction is, uh, right now, is still a state of confusion as to what really transpired. I'm still trying to piece the information together myself. The hit on Colombo had been carried out by Jerome Johnson, an African-American from Harlem, but he was a very unlikely killer. He was a drifter and petty criminal with a penchant for stalking girls on a nearby university campus. He had no record as a hitman for the mob. It was a curious discrepancy for New York's chief of detectives, Albert Seidman. Unfortunately, we have not been able to uh, rule out one possibility or the other. Uh, Mr. Johnson is still some sort of a mystery man to us. What puzzled the police was someone must have told Johnson to undertake the hit and trained him. The question was, who? The African-American link to Harlem pointed to Crazy Joe Gallo. More around town, you hear the gangland theory being pushed that Gallo didn't make a hit on Colombo. Well, this is merely conjecture and rumor, but there is no basis to any of it, as far as we have been able to learn thus far. The simple truth was that other senior Mafia figures must have been at work. Because for over 50 years, no one could be killed without the approval of the Mafia's governing body, the Commission. Every family had a seat on the Commission. If they had to kill somebody, they had to go to the Commission, and the Commission had to vote on it. This would prevent wide-scale killing and trying to take over different families. Under its rules, no family head can be rubbed out without the agreement of the other Commission members. The idea was the head of each family had an equal say on how decisions were taken. It was democracy, mafia style. First place, you're supposed to have permission of all the other bosses to kill a boss. Uh, that's just simple. But boss, bosses can't allow bosses to be killed without, without the permission of the other bosses. Other than, otherwise, none of them are safe. Many therefore concluded that Gambino had to be somewhere behind the hit and had sold it to the commission. I don't think there was much crying in the Gambino camp or the Gallo camp when Joe Colombo was uh, so seriously wounded. But as so often with the Mafia, the Columbus Circle shootings and attempt on Colombo's life went unsolved. There was nothing to pin on Gambino. We're saying that there, uh, Johnson had some connections with the Carlo Gambino family, but uh, we are not making a statement that that was his exclusive connection with organized crime. The one man who might know the truth was Crazy Joe Gallo. Eleven months later, Crazy Joe was eating with his friends at a seafood restaurant to celebrate his 47th birthday. They were sitting at a uh, rear table, this group of six people, when a, uh, a man walked in from the back door and he walked up uh, to the side of the table and he fired uh, three shots. He hit uh, Joe twice and he hit his bodyguard, Pete the Greek, one time. For the FBI and police investigators, the only explanation had to be Colombo family members out for revenge. He was killed by elements of the Colombo family. It was ordered by a guy named Joseph Iacovelli, Joe Yak. He was the consigliere, no, he was the capo in the Colombo family who ordered the hit. But if Colombo's shooting was supposed to bring stability back to the Mafia, it actually signaled the slow demise of the Colombo crime family. Because, leaderless and at war, the family's fortunes turned irrevocably downwards. 
it began to tear itself apart in the decades that followed. The internal power struggles never ended. The Colombo family is now just the shadow of its former self. In 2011, a further 125 of its members were arrested. The family's power has collapsed, for now. As for Joe Colombo, none of this mattered. He never recovered from that day at the rally. He remained in a vegetative state and died eight years after being shot. Funeral services were held today for one of America's leading crime figures, Joe Colombo. If you look at his record, he was only arrested for uh, shooting crap as, when he was 18 years old. Every other indictment, every other accusation came after he became a civil rights leader. And that was another indication on how uh, the media, particularly, uh, champion what law enforcement often gives them. Joe Colombo has left his mark in American society. He died a maverick godfather, a former killer who had dared to do things differently. But by taking on mafia rules and fighting the FBI at the same time, it was a battle he could never win. His picking in the FBI building and police headquarters was kind of stupid. You know, you're not exactly dealing with the faculty at Harvard. Perhaps his biggest mistake was to find the world of civil activism more intoxicating than running a crime family. For a while, he got away with it. People who should have known better uh, joined his committees. He was using civil rights as a, as a shield. In my opinion, he was the fool. Fame would offer Joe Colombo no protection from a failure to obey the most fundamental mafia principles. All Joe Colombo's troubles were brought on by himself. I mean, if he had followed the rules of the mob, particularly the mob bosses, and stay out of the limelight and just operate your business and bring money in, he never would have had a problem. But because he became flamboyant and he got, got his ego swelled, he decided to go out into the public world, which was a major error. In any case, the high-profile civil rights league he founded virtually disappeared overnight.